Hey, hello, and welcome to the third episode of uh, the third rendition of uh, Fan Request. <laughs> Let's try this again. Hello, and welcome to the third time that we're doing uh, fan, re fan Request Roulette here on Answer Everywhere. I wanted to apologize to the folks uh, waiting for the long delay. We had kind of a, uh, a crazy morning. One of our kids has been homesick for several days and I had to, to step in. So we're going to go ahead and do our uh, our choosy thing. And hello to the folks in the chat. I see George was here. <laughs> uh, George was the first. Hello, George. And uh, let's see if I can read this. Edu, Edo Ardot. Hello, Edo Ardot. How's it going? I hope everyone's doing splendidly. It's a nice day here uh, where I am in the US. OK. So somewhere I've got open the Bitcoin price. I need Python, which I think I still have. All right, and okay. So we're gonna take the Bitcoin price as usual, and soon I'll find other sources of entropy. But so far, I haven't done that. All right, so Bitcoin is is down from whenever the price. Maybe is that is that yesterday or is that when the price was just last sampled? Okay, so there's the Bitcoin price, and then we'll add Taylor Swift's latest tweet. Oh, a rain show! I think I read about this. It was so much fun. I don't know how you uh, actually that was useful. I don't know how you prevent all of your equipment from failing if you're running audio equipment in the pouring rain. But I guess Taylor Swift has found a way to do it. And we'll do SHA-512. And I figured since we've done a few of these now, um, we have I have this concept of early adopters, who are the people who um, were, I guess, a little bit earlier than everyone else in jumping on board the Answer Everywhere train. So I want to make sure that they don't have to wait too long. Um, th these were essentially the first requests. So what I think we're going to do to make it sort of more likely um, that they get selected over time is, what have I done? Is just to, uh, instead of rolling a D20 this time, I'll roll a D12. And we'll keep narrowing it down on the platonic solids until uh, until they are selected, and I've discharged that that obligation. All right, I don't know why it was insisting on pasting two pasting two columns, but here we are. Let's go ahead and sort by column B. How do I do that again? Data. I mean, data sort. Okay. So whatever one was, that's not a project at all. Oh, I guess I had spaces here. What is going on? <laughs> Let's see if I can. There we go. Okay. So I'm really taking the top 10, which since this numbering starts essentially at two, will really be the top 11. These will be my top 11. LC has two requests in here. So I'm gonna um, demote the second request and put it on the bottom. Beyond boundaries. Come on now. Can I just drag it? No. Is 
Do we have a new numeric? How about you have my back? Delete one row. Can I paste it down here? Beyond sheet boundaries, huh? Okay, well, whatever is going on, the thing that I'm deleting is QEMU. Maybe it's to here. There we go. All right. Good enough. Um, okay. And then, so what has made it? We've got this empty space here. And we want to make sure that the early adopter is in the top, which maybe QEMU is going to not let me do. But I will paste it on cell 11. There we go. Okay. Then I'll just number these one to 10 so it's easier to see what comes up. Very cool. I'm seeing some stuff in the chat. Hi, folks. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Uh, so I see Zo Zohabe and Pilot Alex and Fossogoss. I've seen some of you folks before. Thanks for thanks for coming back. Thanks for hanging out. Pilot Alex, I'm curious, are you are you actually a pilot of aircraft or some other form of craft? Okay, so here's the top 10. Well, let's go ahead and read them out. We have uh, data intensive applications, MySQL, an HTTP or web server. Oh, wait, hang on, SSH2, we already did. Sorry, uh, open SSH, we already did. So that gives us one more on the top, right? Yeah, it does, but let's do it this way. Insert one row. Maybe you have to switch spreadsheets here. Okay. All right, so something came up. So OpenTX made into the top 10. All right, so data intensive applications, MySQL, an HTTP web server, Free RTOS, which is, I think, a real-time operating system. Ogre 3D, Signal, the uh, messaging chat system. Lazy Git or Lazy Doc Docker. I don't really know what those are, but um, I looked them up. They seemed they seemed interesting. I forget what they <laughs> they do. Glibc, Antler 4, which is the early adopter, and OpenTX. And then the things that didn't make it are Quake, which we already did and some other stuff. Let's go to, so uh, an Emacs flow, RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ, some proof assistant, Xterm or another emulator, Angular, the original Bitcoin code, Wicked Engine, uh, Ghidra, reverse engineering, Clojure or Clojure Script, Serenity OS, X or Wayland, Redux, a tutorial on how I read code, uh, HTTP or HTTPS, or I guess both at once, since they're probably the same code. Um, C groups, which I think was originally a request for Docker, <laughs> but I'm changing it to, I think we should do C groups first. And then I think Docker will be mainly an API around managing managing that sort of stuff. Um, WordPress, GNU Mock and GNU Herd, Monero, uh, Gnome Shell, IWIP, OpenFoam, Apache Spark, GNOME or KDE, NFS, Redis, SQLite, Dart, Getit, HPing3, uBlock Origin, Vue, Sway or, or i3, OBS, QUMU, can I nudge this over? Yeah, okay. A JavaScript engine, probably V8. Um, a, some AI stuff, probably PyTorch. I don't know what ROS is, um, or maybe research papers. I'll probably do PyTorch. I have some plan for doing research papers, not specifically in AI, but in general. And I, I'm just not ready 
<laughs> ready to announce this. That yeah, because I've got so much going on right now. Um, Geth, Metasploit, ZSH, and Grub are the things. These are all the things that didn't make it. All right. Oh wait, no, I was gonna roll a D twelve, wasn't I? Hey now. So more stuff made it. Whatever these two are, In e e the Emacs flow and RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ. Okay, and these two are, oh, hang on, no. Emacs flow does not because um, that's a repeat, that's a repeat one. Let's move that to the, to the bottom. And that means that something else makes it. Didn't I delete this? No more of that. And I guess let's just do it this way. So a proof proof assistant makes it and zero and rabbit and cube make it. I have to improve this process, don't I? I have to automate it somehow. Why did I request the uh Zohe, which one was yours? Sway and I3? Was it in the top 10 before I, I um, so here's the, here's the master list. Sweet. So we're not doing these all in order. We're doing them uh, randomly. So the first part of the random process is, uh, is, the, is essentially generating a top 10 randomly, or in this case, usually a top 20. In this case, a top 12. And actually, now that I see this, LC. I'll see you made a, a ton of requests and they're all great requests, but I want to make sure that other people have, um, have a chance to, to do things here. I don't know why, um, this thing is giving me so much grief right now. Okay. So the thing, so we are essentially promoting that the next one is also LC. So we're, I guess Angular is the one that makes it um, up here. Okay, so that's twelve. So um, so hey, uh, I'm sorry. That's just unfortunately that's just luck of the draw. Elsie, thanks for stopping by. Core utils. I thought core utils wasn't here. Somebody did request core utils. I th think that maybe I'll have to figure out where that is. Maybe you have to go through um, and process and process comments again. <laughs> the uh, you didn't invent uh, indent them as much as request. Oh, intent them as okay. So um, I did them as requests because I think they're all they're all good ideas. So I'm attributing them to you. A lot of them I was thinking about doing anyway. But um, but thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Sorry that I got started so late. Um, and then Pilot Alex is asking about, do I know MGUI? I don't know that. It's a C++ GUI library. I'm not a pilot yet, yeah, but I like aviation. Cool. Well, I hope that you, um, if your dream is to become a pilot, I hope that you, that you achieve that. I don't know anything about piloting or aviation. Uh, are there any, if there are any cool, um, like flight simulators that you would recommend, I would, um, I would be into taking a look at them. Uh, but yeah, sorry, uh, who is this, Zohabe? Um, yeah, sorry, that's just, that's just luck of the draw. Uh, all right, so, so these are our top 12, and these all seem pretty good. This bird has been charged as a multi-request, but they have no other um, requests in the top 12. So I think we're ready to roll a d12. All right, eight. Eight is glibc. <laughs> okay. Can I highlight this? I guess I might as well try to highlight this. Paint? Probably paint bucket. How about orange? Okay, so let's do glibc. 
I don't know where this code is, but let's find it. Let's find it. All right. Um, maybe GitHub. I'm going to guess this is just the same as libc, right? The GNU C library. So sourceware.org. I don't know what sourceware is. Huh. I don't know if this is a mirror or if this is the main source code. It does seem to be on sourceware. Okay. All right. So here's glibc. Let's see if they have it. Um, there's a mirror. Extremely old repo for research purposes. Unofficial mirror. Updated two days ago. What commit is this at? I don't know. And maybe we can do. Here's the summary. Here's the tree. I wonder if source graph will search this repo. I don't know if it knows about um, things other than GitHub. And while it's doing that, let's see if we can clone it. I guess I just call like this. That seems to be working. Okay, seems to be large. Yeah, thanks for understanding, uh, Zoheb. Finally, glibc. By the way, these are all really good requests. Yeah, they these are, are these are all really good requests. Um, just to make that that clear, I'm excited about all of these. I don't think I've gotten a request yet where uh, I, feel, <laughs> I feel like uh, it's not great. Take a look at Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. I don't know if I can, uh, I don't have the source code to that, do I? My, my lights keep dying. I need to, I think, replace or improve my lights here. All right, all right, so um, I have this stuff downloaded in Git. Let me move this chat. A little bit to the side. Uh, let's see. What do you think it's called? It's probably just glibc. And these are all going to be in C, right? So I think I do something like that. No. Invalid options E. What about E tags? Is that what I call? There's some way to generate E tags, right? Oh, capital R is no regex. What's recursive? Little r is regex. What else he takes e? What if we just look up on the internet how to run this thing? 
So, okay, C tags, Emacs. You see text, you must apply the E parameter. But invalid options E. Did I like install a different version of C tags? Did I just use E tags? Hmm. I did this before. It doesn't like the directories. Is E tags the same thing? Yes, E tags and E tags. Let me try uh, looking at the man page in Emacs. Universal C tags. Let me make sure this is a thing that I have. So Samir is suggesting I use find. <clears throat> I can do that. Huh. But I swear that I that I on this show I um that worked. I think I just got installed some other tag system. Let's just see if it's recursive. Let's see if everything is in the same directory. Um I'm not sure. What's something that's in this is huge. Let's look for her lock. Okay. Maybe capital R. Yeah, so whatever I did, I, I um, yeah, there we go. The C tags binary I had was not the binary that I thought I had. So I, I reinstalled it. Okay, so that worked. Great. That was exciting and fun, I'm sure. Um, and then source where is different from source graph. But let's see if source graph was able to, to find that repo. No matches. Well, I guess it probably doesn't really hurt anybody to use this mirror. Maybe I can find out how far behind head we are. Let's do that in shell or shell. So head on shell is this D6C thingamajiggy that ends in 61D. And where are we here on Git, on this GitHub mirror? How do I even find this? So I'm on master. Project security inside pull requests. Those are not things I want. Here's commits. Yeah, this looks like the right commit. D6C. D6C. I'll, yeah, okay. So this seems to be up to date. So let's try um, asking source graph to do this, just so that we have all the, <laughs> all the tools at once. It's going to be my strategy here. Okay, can I click on it? Okay, cool. I think I still don't have Cody, right? Takes me to some sort of onboarding page. All right. So there's way too much here to, so C tags, so Sam, you're saying, yeah, C tags is either the original, which is no longer maintained or exuberant C tags, which is no longer maintained or universal C tags, which is the most mature and up to date. Yeah. I thought that I had universal C tags. I don't know um, what went wrong. I guess I upgraded all my packages. Um, and maybe somehow um, universal C tags got clobbered by, I guess, the original C tags. Okay, so let's get this um, out of the way. We'll save it. Okay, now I have no idea where even to start here. So I'll resist the temptation to start in herd. 
Um, there's a ton of folders. And it was large when I cloned it. This might be roughly the same size as, um, as the Linux kernel. And then in the default folder, we have um, mostly kind of metadata type files, it looks like. And let's look at the Wikipedia entry for glibc. All right, it's the it's the GNU implementation of the C standard library. It seems to have more than just the C standard library, possibly though. It's written mostly by Roland McGrath, working for the Free Software Foundation in 1987 as a teenager. <laughs> uh, described glibc as having nearly completed the functionality required by nearly completed the functionality required by ANSI C, and then by 1992, I guess they had. And CC eighty nine and POSIX one hundred and ninety nine functions. It was migrated to a Git repository in two thousand nine, and it suffered from an ABI breakage bug on S S three ninety. Okay, the functionality. It's the stuff by Unix for Unix and POSIX. And also C11 and C99. I don't know whether um, it's more interesting to look at the C stuff or the POSIX stuff. It supports a bunch of hardware and kernels. I guess we will we will black box maybe. Mm, I, don't, I don't want to look at any particular one of these in depth, but maybe we might see how that stuff is supported. And then we have compatibility layers or shims to allow programs written for other ecosystems to run on glibc interface off operating systems. All right. So Sam, you're suggesting glibc malloc would be interested in those, especially for those used to TC malloc or GE malloc. I don't, I don't know what these words are. Let me look up what is uh, TC malloc? And what is GE malloc? I guess this doesn't have a Wikipedia entry. C dynamic memory allocation. Oh, okay. So TC malloc is Google. It has garbage collection for local storage of dead threads. Huh. Is that one of the reasons that it's more enjoyable to write C++? For large allocations, MMAP or SBARC can be reused. TC malloc, a malloc developed by Google, has garbage collection for local storage of dead threads. The TC malloc is considered to be more than twice as fast as glibc's PT malloc for multi-threaded programs. Interesting. And then what was the other one? JE malloc? All right, FreeBSD and NetBSD has JE malloc, I guess. The lack of scalability of PHK malloc in terms of multi-threading in order to avoid lock contention. Huh. JE malloc uses separate arenas for each CPU. Experiments measuring the number of allocations per second in multi-threaded applications have shown that this makes it scale linearly in the number of threads. Okay. Well, these are these are cool. I had no idea about um lots of attention to to mallocing and whatnot. Okay, so I guess what should we do? Let's start by, I guess, I'm going to pull out this GitHub thing, maybe, and start with GitHub. And let's try to see some of these directories. Like POSIX. Scripts and set jump. Here's socket. Standard lib is probably where I want to be, right? Is that the um, the main place for the standard lib? RT might be real time. EWD, I know, is print working directory. Does that mean that this is the implementation? Here's malloc. And then we have mock and herd. I'm guessing mock might be the mock microkernel and herd is the is the herd operating system. Where did H go? 
H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O-P, all right? And we have GNU lib durant C type CSU conform cat gets bits bench test assert arg e. What is iconf? I've heard of iconf before. Where did it go? Let's look at include, I guess. Login. All of this could be cool. Math, miscellaneous, NPTL, resolve. And then we have signal and sockets. Uh, that's internet stuff. Time, time zones. Okay, so we have a few tabs open that I think look look promising. Um, how do, in Git, how do I... How do I find the first commit? Is there a command for that? Oh, log reverse. Okay. So the first commit in this um, in this Git repo, they must have imported everything, right? Because they didn't switch the Git in 1989 when the first commit was written. So. First of all, how big is this thing? 536 megabytes. And just out of curiosity, the main large thing is the Git history, basically. And then math is big. Why is math big? Math is a bunch of test stuff. Um, Sys depths, local data, icon data. So the things that are big look like they're mostly not the most important thing. Um, but was it Git log reverse? I'm going to look at the first commit just for fun. Okay, so where's Emacs? What? So there's nothing here. The steps and vax and jump buff. <laughs> Is this really all that's here? That's kind of funny. Yeah, okay. So let's see what the first commit was. It's just this one file. To find the machine dependent type jump buff, VAX version. So I guess this was developed on VAX. I don't know what VAX is. Let's see if we can find VAX. Left, well, XFCE, let me tile these windows. Yeah. Virtual address extension. Series of computers featuring a 32-bit instruction set architecture. Uh, they look super cool. They basically look like cabinets with a lock. I guess, are they rack mounted? All right, so this was what the, maybe what glibc was initially developed on, or maybe a terminal that connected to a big cabinet machine. Okay, so fax. All right, and so we just have this jump thing. We just got two pointers, an FP and a PC. Frame pointer, something, something, I don't know. <laughs> and then jump buff. Okay. And then where is uh, git log? And let's try, so, oh, hey now, hey now, in 1989, September 2, we still have initial revision. And then in 1990, there's kind of a gap here. Let's check out this one. And let's copy the 1991, just so we have it in our thingamajiggy. And we, we're still on just systeps. But now we've got some other stuff. FP, I guess, is floating point unit. So the first things we get are like math, like um, I guess arctan, arcsine, cosine, hyperbolic cosine, whatever fabs is, F absolute value maybe, floor, 
log and sine. This is not how I would what I would have expected the um, the initial commits to be. And then I guess in 1990 is that where we are now? Yeah. 1990 we're still getting floating point stuff and jump buff. Okay. That was just out of curiosity. So now we've expanded considerably since 1990. And let's take a look at these some of these directories. Um, and this is so big that I don't really know what I'm um, what I'm getting into or even what I'm looking for. So first, let's see if they have some sort of readme, which would be at the bottom. Is page down going to work? I guess not if I'm on the wrong window. Okay, so no, um, no readme, but POSIX is flat, it looks like. Does it have, it's got a few things. It's got bits, sys, and whatever Rex Spencer is. Rx Spencer. What's bits? We have things like get opt types. All right, what is Rex Spencer? Just tests. All right, so POSIX has things like fork. I don't know if that's the implementation of the fork, the fork thingy. Alarm. I guess let's look at fork. A bunch of bug stuff. Bug regular expression. Test to recompile. Test recompile pattern error messages. So I guess this is testing known bad regular expressions. We have exit. I'll look at fork and exit. I don't know if that's the, those are the ones that we know and love, or if those are like special implementations. CPIO environ exec v. Here's fork.c, which is different from underscore forks.c. GAI st error. I've seen GAI before. Let's see if this will tell us what it is. Or get address info, get adder info. Okay. I think that's for networking addresses, right? Get ops, get groups, get SID, glob. I guess let's look at glob, at least the header. Group member. Init POSIX. Let's look at init POSIX, I suppose. Pause might be cool. P read regex. I'll look at regex. We we looked at um the um GNU said, and what we found was that the regex that that, that under the hood, what they were using was uh, an implementation of regular expressions based on of, uh, finite automata. If, uh, I, I don't remember if there's some other condition other than the finiteness of the automata. But then we found when we were looking, I think at source graph, we, we pulled up a paper from, I want to say Russ Cox, talking about how um, how they built the, the code search at Google. And one of the things he mentioned was that um, that uh, first of all, Ken Thompson, I think is what he said, uh, in, created the, the finite automata algorithm that, that GNU was using. And then the other thing he said was that a lot, most other implementations of regular expressions that don't use finite automata are, are slow. So just to continue that thread, I'm just curious to see if glibc uses the same finite automata library as the other new stuff does. I'm guessing it will. Okay. So we have shed. I'll look at the shed stuff. I thought these look like scheduling, right? So I thought scheduling would be part of the, um, the operating system, not the, um, Get affinity. Huh. So hmm. let's see what the internet says about GLBC scheduling. Basic scheduling functions. We're setting the absolute priority and scheduling policy of a process. On systems that have functions in the section, 
Okay, so maybe this is for setting um, process priority and uh, and the it's just sets the priority maybe and then the priority is consumed by the kernel for the actual scheduling. I don't know. So for example, sketch set scheduler function sets both the absolute priority and the scheduling policy for a policy for a process. It assigns the absolute priority value given by Pram and the scheduling policy scheduling policy policy to the process. And they could be traditional scheduling with sketch other, sketch FIFO first in, first out, and round robin. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so, so so there's some scheduling thing. I'm not sure really how that interacts with the um, with the Linux kernel. So I'll ask um, Bard, how does the glibc how do the glibc scheduling functions interact with the Linux scheduler? And then I'll wait for a reply. And we get a bunch of other stuff. And all of this might be interesting, but there's just so much here that I'll just move on, I guess. This is POSIX. And then here's standard lib, which is not so big, because it is pretty big. A lot of it is stuff that we can ignore. TST, I'm gonna guess, is test. Is that right? That seems right. Um, Stur, stert ul, sub, sub mall, swap context. I look at swap context and, syst and system, tens in lim. I feel like I have to look at tens in lim. I have no idea what that is. S-T-R-O-L, stert -ol. I feel like I've seen that before. Stert of, let's look at stert of and stert tall. String to F. String to float, maybe? A valid floating point number of stir to f using this, yeah, seems to be string to float. Let's verify this before, <laughs> uh, before double check. So yeah, float one, f one, float f two. And then they're being signed the output of this thing, essentially, stirred of, of that thing. Okay. So maybe those aren't interesting functions um, as far as is set env interesting. I guess let's look at set env and set context. Here's right shift. Should we look at that? Because I messed, <laughs> I messed up right and left shift so many times. Rand, I guess we'll look at rand and rand r just for. I don't think this is u random. I think u random uses, um, among other things, maybe hardware randomness. But this might be a, a software only implementation of rand. Mall? I have no idea. I'll look up mall just to see if there's anything interesting in there. MB2. Hmm. And if people see something that, that looks um, fascinating, I'll, I'll take a look at it. A bunch of stuff. GMP. I've seen before, might as well look at it. Get env, I'll look at get entropy, exit, and Erno. Should we look at Erno? Let's look at Erno. And div c, I don't know what a div is. Comp.c, yeah, let's look at that. Hey, binary search, I assume. A2f, A2i, I think a 2 I take something to an integer, maybe ANSI. And I guess let's look at abort. And then we have sys and bits. This is Erno and random. I guess I'll ignore those. And what is bits? Uh, standard lib.h. Monetary. Let's look at standard lib. Whatever these things are. I guess we'll look at them quickly. 
Qsort might be interesting. Oh, yeah. Did you see Qsort? Um, argument to it. Okay. I didn't know what the A stood for. Wikipedia has an A2I entry. Invert to string. These seem to be strings. C string handling. Oh, A2I means, but I don't know because the ASCII, ASCII to enter. Okay. That's what Wikipedia says. But we know that Wikipedia is not always the source of truth. ChatGPT is the source of truth. No, just kidding. Okay. Um, all right. So what is RT? RT should be, I guess, um, real time. And I'm mildly interested in this, but I don't know if I'm interested in this enough to make this like a six hour stream. So, um, I'll look at a couple of these, maybe the Q MQ. Oh, um, and, uh, Samuel, you suggested Q sort. So let me make sure that I have Q sort open. Um, but I guess whatever, I don't know what AIO is, but seems like there's a couple of these. I'll just kind of poke, poke at some at random. Yeah, here's Q sort. Do we have any other sorts? Test sort. M sort. That must be merge sort, right? Might as well look at merge merge sort. All right. Then here's RT. We'll ignore RT. EWD. Maybe this really is um, print working directory. Let's just uh, look at the header, I guess. Then here's malloc. And there's a lot of uh, stuff. Blood tests. Hobstack. I guess let's open malloc in the, the, the header and the, um, in the implementation. We have dynamic, uh, array resize, sorry, dynamic array and also array resize. Let's look at that stuff. That's, that should be interesting. Arena might be interesting. Alec buffer, alloc array. Yeah, let's look at all these stuff, all this stuff. Malik bug, m check, mem usage, more core, m trace. There might be other stuff that's interesting here. AI is, is async IO. Yeah, probably, probably is a, async IO. That's a good point. Okay, so here's mock. I'm not actually going to look at mock, but let's just look at it uh, quickly. Look at the head, the header. How many lines do we have? 103. Is this really the microkernel? For all mock programs. I don't know. There is a request to look at mock and herd. And, uh, but this is not that request. So I, I will do those when we get there. So advantage of GNU mock, it's free software. It's built to survive. Hmm. What is OS, what was OS 10 built on? Wasn't like FreeBSD and, and then a microkernel? Mac. Maybe, um, so mox derivatives are the basis for the operating system kernel and the GNU herd and of Apple's XNU kernel using macOS, iOS, iPad, tvOS, and watchOS. I didn't realize that they used the microkernel on all these things. I guess that's not so surprising. XNU. Hmm. For next. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right, here's herd. I guess there's not a lot here. Herd lock. Herd malloc. Okay, so there's like a quick peek at, at herd. At least we know where some of this stuff is. GNU lib, there doesn't seem to be anything here. You've got a make file and a test. glibc include ARPA. Is it the defense thing? Name server? Okay, we have to look at ARPA. Name server. TFTP should be tiny FTP, right? We're gonna be here forever, I have a feeling. 
All right, then we have RPC, sys, net, net, inet, GNU, bits. And then a bunch of, of I think, probably more mainstream stuff. Including memory. I guess let's look at memory. Poll. Let's look at poll. PTY. We came up against uh, pseudo terminals in, what was it, OpenSSH, which I guess was the last one we did, right? The last of the roulettes. We have shed. shed. I guess the British people would say shed, right? I will call it sked. Spawn and stab. <laughs> Look up spawn and stab. Um, stack info, maybe. Standard IO, I guess. Yeah, I will look at standard lib dot h string and strings. Uh, let's see. U limit. Yeah, sure. Why not? Values, weight, word expression. And then Samir is saying, I think, uh, oh, in glibc, I think pthread might be interesting or how they implement locks. Yeah. That's a good point. Is that here? Is that, um, so we have one in include. Let's look, um, let's look for all of the pthread like things. I think when master, uh, right? Yeah. Let's try finding the pthread stuff. Okay, we got a lot. What is N NPTL? Bunch of sysdev stuff. I guess, so pthread might be um, platform dependent. Is that right? Like PowerPC, libpthread. Uh, sysdeps pthread, and then some NTPL stuff, NPTL. I'm guessing NPTL is, let's look what that is. Native POSIX thread library. Okay, so maybe that's where we want to be. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, maybe N just NP. Yeah. Hmm. Lib pthread compat. So I guess this is different from pthread. pthread attribute, pthread cancel, or maybe this is pthread. I don't know. Let's look at pthread join. pthread mutex lock. Do we just get a pthread.h anywhere? pthread. All right, let's look at join and lock. Mutex lock and mutex init, I guess. Read write lock. So we're not going to get a, a lot of <laughs> spin lock. Okay. SEM clock weight. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we'll look at spin lock. Um, oh, was it, were those all the directories? I'm curious how many tabs I have. Is there a way to count the tabs? If Firefox will count tabs. Oops. Tab counter plus. How do I count my open tabs? Right click a tab. And close them all. Huh. Okay. I don't, these sound like hacks. Uh, I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to jeopardize all my open tabs, I guess, to do those things. Well, maybe I'll try it over here.
Oh, I guess if I do select all tabs, it will give me the option to close them. And there, there are 76 of them. How do I unselect? Maybe these, oh, there we go. Okay. So there's 76 files that I have open. And this is just a, essentially a sampling. Uh, so I don't know how, how much we'll get to. Okay, so here's underscore fork, which I don't think is so important. Maybe it is, is underscore fork implementation, generic version. And we're in the header. And we just have this fork void thing. I guess that this must be the return value. Clone the calling process, creating an exact copy. Return negative one for errors, zero to the new process and the process ID of the new process to the old process. Different than fork, different than fork. This, this functions is marked as async signal safe by POSIX. Hmm. What? So what does it do? This is the implementation, right? This is actually not the header. This is the, this is dot C. So we're going to set Erno to whatever Eno sys is and return negative one. That's, that's the implementation, right? Is this just the generic version in the sense that like, um, everything is, everything's an error. And then we have libc hidden def fork and stuff warning underscore fork. Okay. I think this is maybe just everything is an error. Between fork and v fork, fork and clone. I don't know. Can I, maybe if I, the underscore fork function is similar to fork, but it does not invoke any callbacks registered with pthread at fork, nor does it reset an internal state or locks, such as the malloc locks. In the new sub process, only async signal safe functions may be called, such as dub2 and X, exe cve. Execute a critical vulnerability. <laughs> that's how this means? Okay. Um, so that's underscore fork. That that's maybe not so interesting. That particular implementation. So here's underscore exit. Is this the same thing? Like a generic, um, a generic implementation. The function exit underscore exit should take a status argument and simply terminate program ex execution using the lower order eight bits of the given integer as a status. So we're gonna get the we're gonna and equals. I guess this mask will mask off the lower, everything but the lower eight bits. And then we're gonna abort. And we're not returning anything. So I guess status is just available to, to whoever wants to read it. And then we've got this libc hidden def stuff, which I guess is essentially just registering, registering things somehow. All right, here's fork.c, the non underscore version, and we get what looks like an actual implementation. All right, we're going to call, uh, so we have this function f reset, this, what is it called? This um, formatting is messing with my mind. So I guess the return value is the line above the function. Um, so f reset lock files, I guess we'll reset lock files. Whatever io iter of i is, some iterator. And wait, where does, is this some library they have? Where's IO iterator coming from? I guess it doesn't matter. Um, but they're going to iterate over IO iter end. So somehow IO iter knows what to iterate over. Let's take a look at this in Emacs where I have tags. What did I just do? Um, where am I? Oh, 
So type def file IO iter. So file is, I guess, is being typed def as, as an IO iter or, or vice versa. I forget the syntax. Type def, okay. Provides a keyword called type def, which you can use to, yeah, following an example, define a term byte. So the thing at the end is what's being defined. In the, uh, okay. So we're defining IO iter as a file. Star IO iter is a file. And, okay. Oops. At any rate, we are, I guess, looking at the flags. And ending with a lock. And if this and returns zero, then we're going to call IO lock init with some parentheses and some pointer stuff. And I guess try to lock the file, reset lock files. Okay, I'm not really sure what that's doing, but that's all right. And then libc underscore underscore libc fork. I'm guessing that's maybe the main implementation. Is there just a fork? Oh, this is not Emacs, so I can't use Emacs key bindings, can I? Okay, so underscore libc fork is going to return PADT to determine if we're running in multiple threads. We skip some fork handlers in the single thread case. Okay, to make fork safer to use in signal handlers. So I guess if we're in single threaded, then we don't have to do as much work. Although POSIX has dropped async signal safe requirement for fork, this is the best effort to make is to make it async signal safe, at least for the single threaded case. Okay. Um, all right, so multiple threads. We'll just check if it's multiple threads. We'll look at what uh, pre run fork handlers. On multiple threads is going to give us last run somehow. And then we've got an NSS database data. I have no idea what that is. And if we're not running in multiple threads, we do not have to preserve lock state. If fork runs from a signal handler, only async signal safe functions can be used in the child. So if fork runs from a signal handler. Um, does that mean that we've interrupted a signal and that as a result of the signal, we're going to call fork, we're going to fork a new process? Then only async signal safe functions can be used in the child. All right? These data structures are only used by unsafe functions, so their state does not matter if fork was called from a signal handler. Only used by unsafe, okay. So if we have multiple threads, we're going to use call function static weak with this NSS database stuff. Work prepare parent. And then whatever IO list lock does, I guess somehow lists some locks. And then we'll acquire malloc locks. This needs to come last because fork handlers may use malloc. And the lib IO list lock has an indirect malloc dependency as well via the get dlim function. Okay. And then I guess this is what tries to acquire malloc locks. So call function static weak, malloc fork lock parent. So I guess we're going to prevent the parent from, so we're going to acquire the locks, um, which will lock the parent, I guess, to prevent it from doing mallocking while we copy the stuff we need for the child, perhaps. And then we're going to call underscore fork, which returns negative one in the implementation we saw, we just saw, but probably um, is like platform dependent in some sense, I would guess. Maybe we can see if that's true. And, and that'll give us back the PID, which I think is the PID of the child, right? So the PID is zero, which I thought was like the initial process. 
then we're going to call fork system setup. Um, so I guess I guess if this is the initial process, then this would make sense. You call some setup function, and we'll reset the lock state in the multiple threaded case. And if we have multiple threads, we're going to libc un unwind link after fork. Um, fork system setup after fork. Call function static weak. We'll, we'll release the malloc locks, reset the file list, reset the locks in the I/O code. So I'm glad for these comments because I, it's hard to tell what a lot of these functions do, like fork system setup after work. After fork, I mean. So these are, uh, this is easy. This kind of style is, is easy to read in the sense that um, if you know what the functions, do, functions do, this is a very uh, like recipe style. Like first crack the eggs, then mix the batter, that sort of thing. But if you don't know what the functions do, then it's, it, it's, um, it's hard to read. And the implementations change, right? Um, so you wouldn't know from here whether, whether something uh, crazy is happening under the hood after, after a change is made. So that maybe that's just kind of trade-offs of, of different styles. Then we're going to reset the lock, uh, reset the lock the dynamic loader uses to protect its data. Okay. So I guess the dynamic loader has some lock and we're going to reset it. If PAD is zero, which I think means we're in the initial thing. And then we'll reclaim stacks somehow and run the handlers registered for the child. So run post fork handlers at fork run child, multiple threads, last run. So I guess a child can have handlers and that might also be platform dependent. Otherwise we're not in PID equals zero. We'll check if the fork failed and we'll release. So um, if the fork did fail, we're just going to save the error number, but we're not going to bail out. We'll keep going, I guess. And we'll release acquire either way. Um, we will release acquired locks in the multi-threaded case. If we're multi multi-threaded, we'll call call function static weak. So call function static weak, I guess, is like a different, maybe a slightly different calling convention. And you pass it the function you want to call. I guess you can do that sort of thing and if you're implementing the standard library, right? At any rate, the function we're calling, I guess, is, is malloc fork unlock parent. And then we execute this even if the fork call failed. And we'll call IO list unlock, which I'm not sure what it does. Um, and then we'll run the post fork handlers. And if PID is less than zero, then we are in error. And I'm going to um, set the error number. And we'll return the PID. Cool. So what's the function that gave us the PID? It was underscore fork. So let's just take a look for um, underscore fork. To see if there's a bunch of implementations. You have this NTPL thing. And really, you have Spark 64, ARM. Yeah, there do seem to be a bunch of implementations. If we look at Spark 64, I guess so. Oh, it's just like a list thing. Maybe that's not the implementation. Hmm. I wonder if you can tell me where so it was in POSIX fork, which I think is what we looked at, right? Is this the one that just sets negative one? What about NTPL? So um, underscore fork seems to have a real implementation in, in NTPL. We're just going to call arch fork. And maybe arch fork is the architecture dependent version. And then the arch fork seems to be doing the work. So then we get a PID back. And um, we just check if it's zero and basically return it after doing a little bit more work. What's arch fork? And where are we? Sysv Linux. Call the clone syscall with fork semantic. Yeah, okay. So clone, I guess under the hood, we're in standard library, right? 
So I guess it's the operating system's job to know how to fork. Is that what is that what this is saying? Arch fork. This call clone. Okay. Look at the clone syscall. These system calls create a new child process in a manner similar to fork. In contrast with fork, these system calls provide more precise control over what pieces of execution context are shared between the calling process and the child process. So it seems like fork is calling clone under the hood to have more control, something like that. Here's glob moving along. <laughs> we're like, I, I think I said, we're just going to visit stuff and not really try to get to the heart of, of anything. We'll do a, um, you know, this is like a quick bus tour of Europe rather than um, staying in one particular place for for a month. Okay, so here's glob.h. We've got a ton of defines, like glob error, glob mark, append a slash to each name, don't sort names, if nothing matches, return the pattern, etc. Hmm. Cool. And then we have, um, what is this? Glob meg, CR, glob brace, glob no space. And here's a structure de describing a globbing run. If we're using GNU, we're going to have the stat struct. And whether or not we're using GNU, we have this struct, which you're type defing. And where's the end of the type def? I'm not sure. I guess glob type is the name of it. And what do we have? Uh, glob path, I guess glob, GL is glob maybe? Glob path C, the count of paths matched by the pattern. So we'll keep track of how many paths we have. And the, the list of matter matched path names. Plots to reserve in path V. GL flags, set the flags, maybe, or glob mag car. What is mag car? Used in GL flags, if uh, if any meta car is seen. Okay. Where did my glob type go? Okay. Um, close directory. If glob alt derfunk flag is set, the following functions are used instead of the normal file access functions. Okay. And then we have also, this looks like L stats and stat, I'm guessing, are statistics. And we might do different things. I guess we might have an extra stat. Um, thingy argument if we're using GNU. Compared if we're not using GNU, we have no stats here. And we have this read dir and open dir stuff. These are essentially strings. If dev use large file 64, then I guess we have some other slightly different thing if we're using large files. Um, here's glob, the function, which takes a pattern with this restrict thing. I'm not sure what the restrict thing is some flags, an error function, it looks like, a function, I guess it's called, maybe like a callback, and then pglob, and then this annotation about throwing an L. And here's the, the comment, it says, do glob searching for pattern, replacing results, placing results in pglob. The bits defined above may be set in flags. If a directory cannot be opened or read, and error func is not nil, it is used with the path name that caused the error. And the error no value from the failing call, if it returns non-zero, glob returns glob abend, A-B-E-end. If it returns zero, the error is ignored. If memory cannot be allocated for pglob, glob no space is returned. Otherwise, glob returns zero. Hmm. And we have glob free, free storage allocated in pglob to a previous glob call. And what else? Some redirect stuff. I guess this is the function name, right? Glob, glob free. Huh. I don't know what's going on here. This seems like a function and then it's arguments. And this kind of looks like Lisp. So glob free and then glob, 
Aubrey, if various things are defined. And what else? Cloud pattern P. So this is just the header. Did I open the C? Let's see if we have the C file in here. We do. And glob lstat, that's some, some, some stat stuff. Allocation, underscore glob, do glob searching for pattern. This might be the actual implementation. So we've got a st string thing for the file name. And some stat stuff and maybe metadata. All right, if pattern is null, then we basically error out. POSIX requires all slashes to be matched. This means that with a trailing slash, we must match only directories. Okay, so if the last thing is a um, slash, then we're going to set the only directory flag. And we're going to check if glob doofs is set. I guess that's probably do offsets. Um, have, have to do this so glob free knows where to start freeing. Okay, something about... I guess memory freeing. We'll check if we need to append stuff and check your brace. And if begin is not null, is this the real implementation? Allocate a working buffer large enough for our work. Note that we have at least an opening and closing brace. I'm not sure where the, oh, this is a glob brace. Okay. So just, this is a kind of an insane, I don't know how you would debug this function. Yeah, and I'm not going to really go through and read it. This seems, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask, I'm going to see if ChatGPT is able to understand this function. It's not hard to understand locally, but I think globally, um, there are so many different cases that um, I'm going to guess that either nobody understands all the cases or only a few people do. And everybody else just kind of like squints their eyes and um, and understands maybe a, a small section of it. But just to, to test chat GPT, I'm going to ask what, um, what this function does. <laughs> just too long to find chat GPT. Okay, that's not surprising. Um, and I, I don't think Bard will understand anything about coding, but I'll I'll ask Bard anyway. Oh wait, I asked Bard something else. I was asking about the Linux scheduler. I'll get back to this in a second. At least Bard will will take my um, question. But I'm gonna guess it tells me that it doesn't understand code yet. Oh, no, the, uh, the function, the function glob is a glibc function that is used to expand a pattern into a list of file names. That's right. The pattern can contain a variety of wild cards, such as star question mark and uh, square left square brace. It takes the following arguments, a pattern flags air function in p glob, a pointer to a glob t structure that is used to store the results of the expansion. I'm pretty impressed with this bard. The function first checks the arguments to make sure that they are valid. If any arguments are invalid, the function returns an error. If all the arguments are valid, the function proceeds to expand the pattern. The pattern is expanded recursively by calling underscore underscore glob function on each component of the pattern. For example, the pattern star.c would be expanded to a list of file names foo.c, bar.c, and baz.c. The results of the expansion are stored in glob t, structure pointed to by pglob. The glob t structure contains a list of the file names as well as a number of other attributes such as the flags that were used to expand the patterns. The function returns the number of file names that were found. If no file names were found, the function returns a glob no match. If an error occurred, the function returns a negative value. Here's an example of how to use the underscore underscore glob function. Okay, but is this really using underscore underscore glob? So we're gonna call glob on star.c with some flags, glob error, glob mark null, and I guess it goes into a glob t buffer, the glob t thing. And if the return value is non-zero, because it's returning the error thing, then we then we say that there's an error and return one. Otherwise, we iterate over the path Cs, the, the paths. We 
maybe print them out, and then we call glob pre on the glob buffer. Use code with caution. Okay. Thanks, Bard. I'm impressed that you were able to do that. I did not catch that there was an underscore underscore glob function. Um, here's the underscore underscore glob. Oh, is that what I was looking at? I think that's what I was looking at, maybe. This is certainly a long function. Okay. So yeah, so that's what glob does. Um, let's see what he said, or he. Let's see what Bard said about um, how the glibc scheduling stuff interacts with the Linux scheduler. So the glibc scheduling function interact, functions interact with the Linux scheduler by providing a way for user space applications to set the scheduling policy and priority of their threads. Okay, so it, seems, it does seem like maybe it's just the setting of priority. The glibc scheduling functions are, are implemented in terms of the Linux scheduler APIs. They provide a higher level interface that is easier for user space functions, user space applications to use. Okay. Here are some additional details. When a user space application calls a glibc scheduling function, the glibc library translates the request to the corresponding Linux scheduler API call. The Linux scheduler then uses the information provided by the glibc library to schedule the thread, and it may choose to ignore the request from the glibc library if it's not able to satisfy the request. For example, the Linux scheduler may ignore a request to set the scheduling policy of a thread if the thread is already running under the requested scheduling policy. Linux scheduling, glibc scheduling functions are thread safe, which means that they can be safely called for multiple threads. Yeah, that did help. Thank you. Thank you, Bard. Okay. You know what? Let me change something here. All right, let's see, moving along. So that was globs. I don't know if it was worth spending that much time on globs. What else do we have? So here's int posix, nothing to do, all right? Here's pause, what is pause gonna do? Suspend the process until a signal arrives, but we're just, this is the implementation, but I guess the real implementation must be something else, somewhere else, because we're just gonna have this error. It's supposed to always return negative one and set error no to enter, but rules were meant to be broken. <laughs> okay. All right. So here's regex. And I think I just wanted to look at whether it uses, like what the library it uses is. Is And we've got a bunch of like, um, I guess flags, it looks like. And maybe we don't, what is it called? Include, include limits, include types. Maybe in the header, we don't get um, that kind of information. libc locale limits regex internal.h. How about regex internal? Regex internal. What about the C file? Hmm. What's the um, so GNU regex finite automata library? DFA. Does this use DFA? It seems to use DFA. There's a comment about it. Copy of read DFA's word thingy. Okay. Maybe they don't. Um, maybe they don't import the library, but they use some of the functionality. Maybe you just grab 
recursive DFA. Include her default. Hmm. Can you spell automata like that? There is this re DFA stuff. So it does seem like they're doing something with with discrete finite. I think it's discrete is is the D. Um Maybe regex something that C. All right. Well, it's doing something with DFA. I'm not sure. Is it deterministic? Is it deterministic? Yeah, maybe. DFA. Deterministic. Yeah, it is. That's right. I guess as opposed to a probabilistic one. Yeah, I was wrong. Okay, so deterministic. So what is reverse the uniqueness of the computation run? Okay. Um, not not in the sense of non non probabilistic, but I guess like things always run the same the same way. Are right, they doing something with DFAs? I'm not sure exactly what. They don't seem to just be importing the library. But uh, I think they seem to be using either some of the some of the ideas from DFA or, or reusing some of the structures or something. Okay, so here's schedge, shed, scheduler. So this is just going to set... Um, this, this should essentially just be making system calls um, together with a bunch of like UI improvements or whatever and in the header there's not really anything other than um, defines so i think at at some point we will look at the linux scheduler which i think is where the real magic is and since we just have so much to do i'm going to kind of just ignore the scheduler stuff um count bits cpu count that size cpu set Somehow it's, it's counting CPUs with some whatever a CPU mask is. Counting bit sets, Brian Kernigan's way. Okay, so Brian Kernigan's one of the C guys, right? Uh, I have one of his books. What is it? Kernigan and Richie something? Using an open ended routine is slight better for architectures that do not have a pop count instruction. instruction. Compiler might emit a library call. Let's find out what it, who his co author was. I think Richie, right? The C programming language. Yeah, this is a good book. Kernigan and Richie. Everyone should have this book <laughs> if you want to learn C. I think this is where I, this might be where I learned C first. Okay, so POSIX schedule, uh, scheduler CPU free. And there's just no implementation. I guess the POSIX stuff is mainly uh, like interfaces, what we would consider interfaces in other languages. So there's not really a lot here. And then uh, a, a bunch of the stuff must be platform specific, um, like get affinity. Again, we're just going to set an error and return negative one. Uh, we'll ignore all this scheduling stuff. Standard lib swap context. Again, this seems to be just a dummy implementation. System.c, same. So Sam, you were saying, yeah, the C programming language book and the Unix programming environment are great books. I think I have the Unix programming environment too. Is that the is that one really big? C programming language is really tiny. Uh, tens in lim. Definitions according to the lim size used. Oh yeah, I think limbs are used for um, some kind of number system. I don't know if it's like uh, MP. Is it multi precision? Tens in lim. Max dig per limb is plus one. Zero. Is this like zero tens in the one place? Ten tens in the. No. Why don't we have a one? We go zero, ten, one hundred, one thousand. So from here, we're just multiplying by ten, right?
mplim. Bits per mplim. Let's look at mplim. GMP. Arthritis. Military police officer. I guess they have to deal with limbs. Um, number? No, uh, maybe this is from GMP. This manual, an integer usually means a multi-precision integer as defined by the GMP library. The C data type for such integers is MPZT. Is this like just big integers? What does multi-precision mean? Multiple precision for an integer. I guess you can store, like in a compact representation, maybe you can store large integers as well. We also have rational numbers, which is a multi-precision fraction and a floating point number. A limb means the part of the multi-precision number that fits on, in a single machine word. So this is maybe a little bit like scientific notation. We have some, um, the word's going to contain like significant bits, I guess. We choose this word because a limb of the human body is analogous to a digit. Okay, so it's like a pun, only larger, and containing several digits. Okay, normally a limb is 32 or 64 bits. C data type for a limb is MP limb B. Counts of limbs of a multiple precision number represented in C type MC size. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. exactly what it means to be a multiple precision integer. Stack overflow might know. The term is a misnomer. The precision doesn't vary. Only the size of the representation changes. The term precision is probably used because we refer to 32-bit float representations as single precision and 64-bit float representations as double precisions. So I guess some sort of analogy with float. Let me answer my own question. If the processor, okay. Arbitrary precision. Okay, big num. <laughs> what I want to know is this just big numbers? I think it is. I think it's just big numbers. We can have integers that are larger than than whatever sixty four bits. Okay. Why don't I just call it big num? I right, see. So here's stirt string to float, and we have no implementation. I guess. What is this header even doing? We've got some defines. Oh, this is not a header. This is a, a C file. And we're going to include str2. We're going to undef string to float 32 if this thing is defined. And we've got this weak alias thing. So I guess there's no implementation here. There must be an implementation maybe in, again, maybe in um, the specific hardware places. So similarly with string to L, I'm going to guess all of this, all, everything in the standard lib thing. Well, no, maybe not. Here's add to environ. This function is used by set env and put env. The difference between the two functions is that the former must create a new string, which is then placed in the environment. So what is it going to take? It's going to take a name, a value, I guess a combined thing, and re whether to replace. So where is the environment? At some point, we're going to lock compute length before locking, so the critical section is less of a performance bottleneck. I'm just curious. So, IP last environ. If we allocated the space, we can extend it. Where did last end come from? Last environ. Okay. So if this, so we have this static variable. If this variable is not a null pointer, we allocated it. We allocated the current environment. Okay. So this is the static, like, um, the static variable. And I guess we just put stuff in it. Is that what's going on? We're going to get a copy of the, uh, is it, wait, sorry, is this called last environment? Yeah. Okay. We're going to get a pointer to the last environment and reallocate some stuff. I guess grow it. Avoid using the raw reallocated pointer to avoid GCC. So we can extend it if we allocated it. Okay. So you might extend the last environment. And then 
The last thing we do is we set envir underscore underscore environ to new environ. So where did underscore underscore environ come from? Is it also a global thing? We're going to define underscore under, we're going to define environ to be underscore underscore environ. So this is, I guess, if we don't have libc, we'll do that. Well, now I need to know where um, this was defined. I don't think I see the definition. So since we have tags in Emacs, did I shut Emacs? Oh, it's set in environment.c, unsurprisingly. This, so it's just a car. Let's say it's a static car. This must be initialized. We cannot have a weak alias to BS, into BSS. What is BSS? I'm not sure. Okay, so environment is just a car star star. And we're just uh, using it as the environment, I guess. It's just a string, really, right? Or a, an array of strings, I guess is what it is. Cool. So that means that to look up something in the environment, I guess we need linear search. We set context, which has no real implementation. Right shift, R shift, I'm guessing is right shift. MPN, R shift, shift, right, a low level, Natural number integer. This is, I guess, multi-precision right shift. So um, this will depend a lot on how they chose to represent um, multi-precision integers. So I guess I'm not going to look at this too closely. But we've got some high limb stuff and low limb stuff. All right. That seems like that might actually be fun. Uh, that seems like a good exercise. Uh, implementing right shift, uh, a relatively easy exercise if you want to get to know um, these GMP numbers, I guess. There's, there's certainly some, almost certainly some edge cases that you have to deal with. Here's rand. We turn a random integer, and they're just going to call underscore underscore random. But where does that come from? No definition is found for underscore underscore random. Why not? Random R. Why is this not the definition? If you're using the trivial type, the trivial type zero random number generator just do the old linear congruential bit otherwise we'll do our fancy trinomial stuff which is the same in all the other cases due to all the global variables that have been set up the basic operation is to add the number at the rear pointer into the one at the front pointer then both pointers are advanced to the next location cyclically in the table the value returned is the sum generated Reduce to 31 bits by throwing away the least random low bit. Note, the code takes advantage of the fact that both the front and rear pointers can't wrap on the same call by not testing the rear pointer if the front one has wrapped. Returns a 31-bit random number. 31 bits. Okay. Huh. So, uh... Just do the old linear. I think linear con congruence is, is probably. Is that the von Neumann thing? Let's look up von, von Neumann. Random number generator. Nineteen forty six. No. 
early computer-based PRNG suggested by John von Neumann in 1946 is known as the middle square method. The algorithm is as follows. Take any number, square it, remove the middle digits of the resulting number as the random number, then use that number as the seed for the next iteration. For example, the square the number 1111 yields 1234321, which can be written as zero with the zero in front. Uh, this gives 2343 as the random number. Repeating this procedure gives 4896. This is the next result. And he, von Neumann used 10 digit numbers, but the process was the same. Hmm. So I guess he did not do linear congruent. Why does he keep selecting this window? It's not bad. Up until 2020, Java still relied on a linear con congruential gen uh, generator. Whereas PRNG, which is of low quality. Java support was upgraded with Java 17. What's going on, Java? All right, so the linear congruential generator takes a, yields a sequence of pseudorandom numbers, yeah. Calculated with a discontinuous piecewise linear equation. It's one of the oldest and best known random number generators. So it's based on the recurrence relation x n plus one. It's going to be some uh we're going to take an A. I don't know where A gave, came from. But we're going to add uh, the, the previous iteration. We're going to multiply by A and add some constant. And then take it modulo some M. So I don't know if M, A, and C are like inputs into the, into the generator, like the C essentially. So the M is the modulus, yeah. And A is the multiplier. C is the increment. And the seed or start value is, is, is X0. If C is equal to zero, it's called a multiplicative congruent generator. And it was published in 1951, which is only a few years after the von Neumann one. Okay. Well, it's fast because it's linear, but it's got that going for it, which is probably super important 1950s. Okay. So here's glibc, uh, random C. I guess we don't care about this. What is this? Some magic number? The algorithm is mentioned the ISO C standard here, extended for 32 bits. The next is set to whatever this is. Oh no, we're going to take next and multiply by this number, and then we're going to add this number. So this is the linear congruence thing, I think. And then we're going to take this modulo 2048. And then we're going to do the same thing, except their magic constants have changed. And we're taking a mod 1024. So I guess in the first case, we get more data. And then we shave it down and then we, oh, and here we're doing XOR, uh, right? XOR equals. Okay. So this is more or less the same thing, except this, um, these three lines are, look like the standard, um, linear congruence thing, but, and then we're like kind of doing the same thing again, but with twists. And sometimes in cryptography, you do things multiple times, <laughs> like uh, triple des, um, and you get a little bit more security by doing it that way. Here's mall.c. This is just um, multi precision multiplication. Again, this is probably this would probably be pretty interesting for um, for an exercise figuring out how to multiply the the big number thingamajiggies. And I'm going to just ignore all the big number stuff. Get. I'm going to also ignore get environment. Here's Erno. I don't know if Erno is interesting or not. Uh, nothing, nothing so interesting here. Seems like Erno might be system specific. Here's CMP. What are we comparing? This is more MP library stuff. So multi-precision. Okay. I'll keep ignoring multi. Here's B search. What I'm going to guess is binary search. We're including bits, standard lib binary search. Let's see if we can. Just add bits here. 404. Hmm. Well, I want to see some binary search. See if, uh, It seems to be in just not in standard lib, just in bits. Yeah, 
in USB search. This code is unreadable because of all the underscores, but we've got many underscore variables, including LU and IDX, and a P and some comparison, int. And what are we taking in? We're taking in a key. A base. I don't know what base is. N memb a size and a compare function. We're setting L to zero and zero to N memb. And while L is less than U, what are we doing? We're doing binary search, right? So I guess we have some sort of sorted something. Maybe the base thing is the thing that's sorted. At any rate, while L is less than U, we're going to get the midpoint, set index to the midpoint. We're going to set P to uh, <laughs> casting whatever base is, I guess, as a void star thing, plus the midpoint times the size. And then we're going to call the comparison function. And the comparison is less than zero. Oh, so U and L must be upper and lower. If the comparison is less than zero, I guess we'll set the we'll reset the upper bound. And if the comparison is bigger than zero, we'll reset the lower bound. And then probably call ourselves recursively, right? Or I guess otherwise we'll return P cast as a void star. Shouldn't it be a recursive call? Oh, oh, no, because we're in a while loop. Okay. Yeah, that, that looks like a standard binary search. Cool. It's nice to, to uh, see one in the wild, I guess. Um, here's A2I. I think there's not going to have an implementation. Yeah, okay, so we'll ignore that. Abort. Calls an abnormal program term termination with core dump. We've got this SIG action act thing. We're going to acquire a lock, libc lock lock recursive. And now it's for sure we are alone, but recursive calls are possible. We're going to unblock sig abort by, and we'll check the stage. If stage is zero, we'll increment the stage, do some stuff with sigs. If stage is one, we'll uh, send a signal which possibly calls a user handler. Okay. We'll also call lock unlock recursive on the lock. This stage is special. We must allow repeated calls of abort. When a user defined handler for SIG abort is installed, this is risky since the Ray's implementation might also fail, but I don't see any other prop. I don't see another possibility. Okay. And then we'll check if stage is two. The handler was installed and I'll remove it. We'll increment the stage. I guess this is stage of the abort process. I guess that's what's going on. That's why we, I see. So if we're in stage two, we'll increment the stage, I guess, because we're in stage three next. We'll mem set some stuff, do some stuff with handlers, fill some mask, sig action, sig abort. And if we're in stage three, we'll, I guess, try again. We'll just re-raise sig abort. Stage is four. Now I'll try to abort using the system specific command. If stage equals four, then we've gone past stage three and maybe sig abort failed. And whatever an abort instruction is, it seems like we're escalating. And if we're in stage five, if we can't signal ourselves and the abort instruction failed, exit. Okay, so this is really hope, all hope is lost, I guess. And we're just calling exit. And if even this fails, try to use the provided instruction to crash, or otherwise make sure we never return. And it's going to say, well, it's in an infinite loop. We're going to call it abort instruction forever and ever. Very cool. So where is the core dump? Is this the core dump? Act. SA handler, sig fill set. I'm not sure where the core dump is. Maybe the core dump is handled implicitly by sig action or whatever. Hello. Hey, Igram. How goes it? All right. 
Let me check something here. All right, so that was fun. That was a board. And where am I now? Standard lib.h. Here's the standard lib header. Did I just close a board? Yeah, okay. I use the standard lib.h. And I'm not sure what's going to be here. We've got some real path stuff, some external curl. Uh, external car stars, real path, error, never include bit standard lib h dot directly, directory, ah, directly use standard lib dot h instead. Fortify function, I don't know what fortify the function does. And a bunch of external stuff. We would have to include limits.h to get a definition of mb langmax, but this would only disturb the namespace. So we defined our own version here. Okay. So I guess if you're in standard lib.h, you don't want to, you want to be careful about what you include. And really it's just a bunch of extern stuff. And we've got this fortify, glibc fortify. WCS tombs. I have no idea what any of this is. NTH, redirect NTH, real path check. Second argument of real path must be either null or at least path max bytes long buffer. So real path should give you the, the path of a thing. Let's look up real path. Do I have real path installed? Real path is prints the resolved path, absolute file name. All but the last component must exist. Does this um, expand symlinks forever? Let's try. So I have some symlink stuff in this directory. What? Oh, that's not a directory, that's two directories. So let's see if I can find the real path of this thing. And I bet that this is actually a file, not another symlink. Yeah, okay. But if I just do I just do this, this might be um, a symlink to a symlink. No, it seems to be a real file. Okay, well, never mind. I think real path probably unwinds symlinks, but I'm, I'm not gonna find a uh, symlink to a symlink to, to double check. At any rate, real path appears, it seems like, as one of the first things in standard lib.h. So I guess one of the things standard lib.h must be concerned with is finding out where things are, knowing where files really are. Um, we've got this limit stuff and path max and PTS name. Pseudo, no, I don't know what PTS is. I don't know what NTH is. And I certainly don't know what fortify is. So I'm not going to go too deep, but I will look up what glibc fortify is. Fortification level. The gains and costs. Is this for memory? For several years, a fortify source pre-process, pre-process, pre-processor macro inserted error detection to address the problems at compile time and runtime. So there's some sort of security memory stuff, I guess. Cool. Moving along. Here's monetary LDBL. Hmm, for monetary functions. Lib, I don't know what this is. Never include bits monetary. I shouldn't be in bits. 
I should, I guess, use monetary.h. Header files for monetary values formatting functions. Okay, so this is for like formatting monetary values, like such and such dollars or such and such cents. I'll ignore that. Standard lib float. There's nothing really. What is nth? Hmm. Come on, duck, duck, go. NTH. Hmm. Maybe Bard will know. Bard helped me out before. What does NTH stand for in the DLibC source code? Bard is thinking. It stands for no throw. It is used to indicate that a function does not throw exceptions. Okay. Cool. That's good to know. That's actually helpful. Thanks, Bard. Seems like Bard has been improving its game. It didn't used to know what uh, what code did, but now it seems to. Okay. Here is standard lib ldbl. And I guess there's not, not so much interesting. Here's mq. Is there anything interesting here? This is in real time. So I said I wouldn't look really at real time yet, um, but we'll, we'll we'll glance quickly at it. Oh, and you know what? Long ago, I should have updated my. I knew there was something that I I should have done. I'll update the title. Okay. So um, we have some MQ, maybe message queue. And MQ open will establish a connection between a process and a message queue. Yeah, message queue name and return message queue descriptor or negative one on error. O flag determines the type of access used. If O create is on O flag, the third argument is taken as mode T. So we can open a queue, close it. We can get attributes, set attributes, unlink and notify. Remove message queue. Register notification. Receive the oldest from highest priority messages in message queue. Okay. So I guess in addition to priority, they have an age. And you get the, the priority queue or whatever implementation um, among equally equal priority messages must sort by age or something. Time to send, etc. And this is just a header, so this is not um, implementations. I'm guessing the implementation is probably platform specific, but I'm not going to actually dig into it. And here's AIO, which I think Samir suggested might be async IO. Asynchronous, yeah, look at that, Samir. You're right. Um, so asynchronous IO control block. This is AIO CV, and we've got file descriptors. AIO filled as, wow, this is the, everything else we've seen abbreviates file descriptors as FD, but uh, the real-time system is going wild and calling them filled as. And then we have LIO opcodes, which is the, the operation to perform. So I guess it has some sort of opcode structure, opcode system. You can request request priority offset. Maybe that's about changing priority. And then a location of a buffer, I guess, to look in the length of transfer and a signal number and value. And then we have internal members like next prio, I guess, next priority, which will return a control block, apps priority, maybe absolute priority, policy, and error code. And more stuff of similar type. Okay, it's a quick peek at some of the real time stuff. I guess we'll ignore IO notify. 
There's a request to look at um, RTOS, which I think is a real-time OS. So hopefully that, that'll be a time when we can look at some real-time stuff. And it, we're going to continue looking at the, the Linux kernel. So uh, we may see some of their real-time support at some point as well. All right, here's QSort, which I think Samir requested. I'm not sure if Samir is still, <laughs> still around, but... Um, okay, so here's, here's QSort. Um, we've got the swap thing, which will byte-wise swap two items of the same size. Byte-wise swap them. I don't know what that means. So I guess, let's look at, let's see what it does. So it's, the, it's defined, it's like a macro. Give it an A, B in, this, in size. Um, I guess it means that we're gonna swap their pointers essentially. So we're gonna take the size and, and set it to a size T, which is called underscore underscore size. And we're gonna set A, oh no. Where did underscore underscore a come from? And we're going to set a, essentially a underscore underscore a to be a, the pointer to a, it looks like, and underscore underscore b to be the pointer to b. And then in a do block, while um, size, while there's more size left, we're going to, yeah, okay, have this temp variable, set it to a, set a's next slot to b, set B's next slot to temp. Oh, no, wait, I think increment, increment after the variable increments after assigning, I think. So we're setting the current slot and then incrementing it, I believe. Um, and so I guess byte wise means that we're just swiping byte by byte and walking down these, these pointers, which makes sense. Let's double check the increment. Um, yeah, I think after is post increment, right? Plus plus A, can someone explain the sequence? Yeah, okay. Is this asking about more now? I thought maybe this was asking about plus plus a plus plus. So one is past x y z, then a is incremented. Okay, yeah. So that so that's post increment. Okay, cool. So that's just some swap function. And then we've got a struct that has a high and a low. And I guess we're going to pass it around as a struct. Um, and it's called a stack node. Stack node declarations used to store unfilled partition obligations. Unfilled partition obligations. Okay. And then the next four defines implement a very fast inline stack abstraction. The stack needs log total elements entries. You could even subtract log max threshold. Since total elements has size as type size T, you get an upper bound for log total elements, bits per byte of car bit times size of size T. Okay, that's an upper bound for the log total elements. I don't know why it's an upper bound. I guess maybe not everything might be populated in the size T thing. At any rate, we have a stack size, which is car bit times size of size T. And then we have push and pop operations. And something to check if the stack is not empty, you check if stack is less than top. And to push something, we're going to set top low to whatever was an LOW. We'll set top, top high so it was in um, high, and we're going to pre-increment top. The push just takes low and high. And then pop also takes low and high. And we're going to pre-decrement top. We are going to set low to whatever top low is and high to top high. I don't know what this is doing. We're pushing two things. So we have a stack and we're pushing two things on it. 
and we're popping two things off of it at a time, it looks like. Let's see, see how it's used, though. Maybe one is the thing that you want to push, and one is the index where it goes, essentially. I'm not sure. Um, so here we have the order size using quick sort. This implementation incorporates four optimizations discussed in Cedric. Hey, they're, <laughs> they're using Cedric, which is a classic algorithms textbook. Um, so it's non-recursive using an explicit stack of pointer that store the next pointer partition to sort. OK, so instead of being recursive, they're going to kind of like fake recursion by, um, I guess, in recursion, your op use your operating system stack to handle um, the order that things happen. And so here, they're going to have an explicit stack that they that they model with, with these operations. To save time, this maximum amount of space uh, required to store an array of size maxes allocated on the stack. So we allocate the maximum using a 32-bit or 64-bit integer for size t. This needs only whatever this many. Pretty cheap, actually. Okay, use the pivot element using a median of three decision tree. So median of three. So I guess they're going to give it three numbers and, and take a median. This reduces the probability of selecting a bad pivot value and eliminates certain extraneous comparisons. Hmm, interesting. And then only quick sorts total elements over max thresh partitions. Leaving, OK. So if um, we use quick sort until the number of total elements divided by max threshold is, is reached. So this is, is like some cutoff. And after the cutoff, they're going to use insertion sort to order the max thresh items within each partition. OK, so you, you, you drill down to some small size. And I guess at the, uh, at the at, after you drill down enough, um, the overhead of quick sort is, is high enough that it's just faster to use insertion sort, even though I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but I believe quick sort should be um, asymptotically faster than insertion sort. But we'll, we'll verify that. But anyway, when you get down low, low enough, wait, is it, I think it's sort of short. Is that just linear? That might just be iterating over things and inserting them, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. And then um, in four, the larger of the two subpartitions is always pushed onto the stack first. So if you have two subpartitions, you always put the larger one on the stack first with the algorithm then concatenating, uh, concentrating on the smaller partition. OK, this guarantees no more than log to element stack size is needed. OK, so maybe the two things that you're pushing on are um, what you're really pushing on is essentially like a partition, but you're thinking of the partition as having a low end and a high end. I'm guessing that's what these push and pop things do. And that would make sense, but let's double check what insertion sort is. And that. <laughs> Did I type, type that incorrectly? All right, let's see, simple sorting algorithm that builds the final sort array one item at a time by comparisons. Yeah, OK. Algorithm. So we're going to do there's a, uh, each, each iteration in search sort removes one element from the input data, finds the location it belongs to in the, oh, wow, and sorts it there. Yeah. OK. The worst case is O n squared, and the best case is O n. So I don't know why. So this is worse than linear sort, right? Oh, wait. No, linear sort's not possible. Right. So quick sort should be what? n log n. Oh, quick sort is also worst case O n squared. I forgot about that. Best case is OA and log in. OK. Or ON for a three-way partition in equal keys. Average performance is ON log in. And then what's average performance of, of uh, average perf performance for insertion sort is ON squared. OK. But for small, but for small values, insertion sort is fast. OK. All 
All right. So that that's the that's the, that's the background. So let's look at the implementation. We're going to take p base and total elements and size and some comparator function and whatever arg is. Got a void star arg. Um, and we'll set the base pointer to p base essentially. We've got this max threshold computation. And if we have no elements, <laughs> avoid lossage with unsigned arithmetic below. With no elements, we're just going to return. Um, and if we, if our total elements is bigger than the max threshold, we're going to set low to the base pointer, set high to low at size plus total elements minus one. Yeah. And then we're going to create a stack node of the stack size and set its top to stack. Or oh, set, set the pointer of the top, the point to stack. Which, since we just allocated it, should be basically the zero position. Is that right? And while the, stop is, the stack is not empty, we are going to get, um, I guess, create variables for the left and right pointer. And we're going to select the median value among the low, mid, and high. OK, so rearrange low and high so the three values are sorted. This lowers the probability of picking a pathological pivot value and skips the comparison for both left pointer and right pointer in the while loops. So star mid is going to be low plus size times high minus low divided by size right shift one. And if mid, so we're going to compare, we're going to call compare this funny syntax. I think. Oh no, this is because um, compare is a function that, that's passed in, right? Yeah. Okay. So if mid is, I guess, less than low, we're going to swap mid and low. If mid is bigger than high, we're going to swap mid and high. Otherwise, we're going to go to jump over. And if mid uh, is less than low again. We're going to swap mid and low. What? Didn't we just do this? Why are we doing this twice? Am I missing something here? So mid, low, and arg, less than zero, swap mid, low size. If we hear then mid and low should have been swapped once. If we're here, then mid is less than high. Sorry, if we, um, if mid is less than high, then we ignore this if, and we, and we go to jump over, which just ignores the second if. So, um, I guess the problem is we, when we swapped mid and high, we might have to swap mid and low again, but there's the ordering of this is a little bit confusing. I, th I guess that's what's going on. So then jump over, I guess is here maybe at any rate, we've picked our pivot through this logic, I guess. Um, and then we'll set the left pointer to low plus size, the right pointer to high plus size. And here's the famous collapse the wall section of quicksort. Gotta like those tight inner loops. They are the main reason that this algorithm runs so much faster than others. And we're going to do while, while left pointer is less than or equal to right pointer, we're going to call some inner while loops. So while um, the comparison function of left pointer and uh, let's see, left pointer in mid is less than zero. And I guess arg is an argument to the comparison function. I don't know what else arg would be doing, but it seems to always be passed into comp. So while I guess left is smaller than mid, um, we're going to in increment the left pointer. While right, while mid is smaller than right, we're going to increment, we're going to decrement the right pointer. And then if left pointer is less than right pointer, we're going to swap them. We'll check if the left pointer is mid. In which case we're going to reset it to right. Otherwise, we'll check it if it's the right pointer. In which case we'll reset it to left. 
and increment left pointer and decrement right pointer. Otherwise, if left pointer is equal to right pointer, they will increment left pointer and decrement right pointer and break. Okay. And then after that while loop, we're going to set up pointers to the next iteration. First, determine whether the left and right partitions are below the threshold size. If so, ignore one or both. Otherwise, push the larger partitions bound onto the stack and continue sorting the smaller ones. So first, determine whether left and right partitions are below the threshold size. Okay, so if they're below the threshold size, I think that's what kicks off ins insertion sort, right? If so, ignore one or both. Otherwise, push the larger partitions bounds on the stack and continue sorting the smaller one. Okay. So this is the threshold check. And if the high minus left pointer is less than or equal to max threshold, ignore the small right partition. We'll set high to the right partition, which I think is eventually going to push it onto the stack. Where's the stack thing? Yeah, bounds on the stack. Yeah, okay. And then um, otherwise, otherwise, high minus left pointer is bigger than max threshold, in which case we take right pointer minus low and check whether it's bigger than high minus left pointer. And if it is, we push the larger left partition indices by calling push low right pointer low equals left pointer. Otherwise, we push the larger right partition. Okay. So once the base pointer array is partially sorted by quick sort, the rest is completely sorted using insertion sort. Since this is efficient for partitions below max threshold size, base pointer points to the beginning of the array to sort, and end pointer points at the very last element in the array, not one beyond it. Okay. Hmm. So I think the usual convention is to point one beyond it. But, uh, but that's fine. So we're going to define min just to be the standard min thing. And we've got this curly brace, but I don't know what it corresponds to. Um, so this must be insertion sort, right? So we've got to take some min, that's going to be the threshold, find the smallest element in the first threshold and place it at the array's beginning. This is the smallest array element and the operation speeds up insertion sorts inner loop. Okay, so this is just, we're going to find the small elements and put them in order. Um, hmm. So we pushed some stuff under the stack, but where didn't we pop it? Oh, we popped it here. So we might ignore both small partitions, in which case we pop something off the stack. We might ignore small left partition. Yeah, this is, a, this is kind of a wild implementation. Uh, and I'm curious what max threshold is, because that's going to tell us, that's going to, that's part of the information about when we're doing insertion sort, right? Is this going to wrap around or what? Yeah, max threshold is four. Discontinue quick sort algorithm when partition gets below this size. This particular magic number was chosen to work best on a sun for <laughs> 260. Huh. That's an important way to choose your quick sort. Sun 4. What era was this chosen? Sun 4 260. Ah, 128 megabytes max RAM. Almost in 1987. Huh. I'm curious if this ever gets tuned. People must tune. I guess they just have other implementations of quick sort that use if they really need tuning. So here's msort. This must be like merge sort, right? msort with temp. And I guess I'm not really going to read this, but this, this is pretty fascinating that we can find it. Here's qsort r. What makes it r? Not sure. Just a comment here. We cannot compute fizz pages times page size and compare the needed amount of memory against this value. The problem is that some systems might have more physical memory and can be represented with a size t variable. Um, so msort is going to take an msort param, a void star b, and a size. And it's calling recursively merge sort 
uh, M's are with temp. And then I guess this is the merge function, which looks hard to read with all the variable names and all the um, other stuff in there. So I'm going to ignore it. So here's PWD, which I will ignore. Here's malloc. Are we about two and a half hours in? Um, allocate size. Here's calic. Allocate, uh, what is N M E B A M B? You can realloc. So what is it really doing? It's got this throw thing and it's actually, these are all externals. Is that because malloc is a system call? Um, here's malinfo. Malinfo has, I guess, stuff, right? Arena, non memory mapped space allocated from the system. Um, number of free trunks, free chunks, number of fast bin blocks, and memory mapped regions, uh, use memory blocks, always zero, preserved for backward compatibility. FSM blocks, U word blocks, forward blocks, and keep cost. Malinfo 2. You have some more stuff. This is, I guess, a, the successor to Malinfo. Hmm. But where's the actual allocation done? These are all extern. extern. So where where is the extern? Um... Let's just try searching. Let's try grepping. Lots of malics. Maybe the thing I should grep is um, this is a tags file. Unix libc. It seems like, yeah, it seems like malloc is uh, ultimately being defined maybe in, well, maybe not. Define malloc machine. Oh, so where is, I, mean, I guess it's part of the kernel, right? See if GitHub will let me search. Nope. Commits. Add malloc failure. Add malloc failures. Test mem control. I think it's probably part of probably the, so um so maybe the standard library doesn't do a whole lot. There's no system call called malloc. However, there are two system calls for applications memory, which are Burke and MMAP. Okay, so um, so Burke and MMAP. Let's see if we can find calls to Burke. Yeah, there are some calls to Burke. Systeps Unix. Let's try. This thing. Malik Malik. This seems to be a real imp implementation. All right, so let's look at let's look at uh, malloc malloc. What is the other thing I'm looking at? glibc slash malloc. Okay, we got a huge um, comment. This is a version, aka pt malloc, of malloc free realloc written. By Doug Lee and adapted to multiple threads slash arenas by Wolfram Glogger. There have been substantial changes made after the integration into glibc in all parts of the code. Do not look for much commonality. 
with the PT malloc 2 version. So why use this malloc? This is not the fastest, most space conserving, most portable, or most tunable malloc ever written. However, it is among the fastest while also being among the most space conserving, portable, and tunable. Consistent balance across all these factors results in a good general purpose allocator for malloc intensive programs. The main properties are for large, bigger than or equal to 512 bytes, it is a pure best fit allocator with ties normally decided via first in, first out that is least recently used. For small requests, it is a caching allocator that maintains pools of quickly recycled chunks. For in between and for combinations of large and small requests, it does the best it can, trying to meet both goals at once. And for very large requests, bigger than or equal to 120 kilobytes by default, it relies on system memory mapping facilities if supported. Okay. I think we learned about PT Malik. Um, actually, I think this chat is still here. So Samir had mentioned TC Malik and JE Malik. Let's see if we can find PT Malik. So DL Malik, I guess that's we just saw Doug Lee developed in the pu public domain. It was a general purpose allocator starting in 1987. Yeah. William Gloger, P threads Malik, a fork of DL Malik with threaded improvements. It's a boundary tag allocator. Memory on the heap is allocated as chunks in eight byte aligned data structure, which contains a header and usable memory. Allocated memory contains eight or 16 byte overhead for the size of the chunk. Unallocated memory is grouped into bins of similar sizes implemented using a double linked list of chunks with pointers stored in the unallocated space inside the chunk. Bins are sorted by size into three classes. And this is what, basically what we saw in the um in the code comment so let's just take a quick look and this is long right first of all where's my line numbers six thousand lines of code a bunch of weak alias stuff Yeah, this looks pretty intense. Here's malloc info, a function, which takes options in a file a file pointer. And it has things like the total number of blocks, whether malloc has been initialized. If it hasn't, we'll init pt malloc. F puts. We're going to print the malloc version. I guess this is for getting info about malloc. Okay. I'm just kind of scrolling through and seeing uh, and seeing what I see. We've got a bunch of comments. This is very well commented. Update in 2006. This was the above was written in 2001. Since then, the world has changed a lot. Memory got bigger. Applications got bigger. The virtual address space layout in 32-bit Linux changed. In the new situation, Burke and MMAP space is shared, and there is no artificial limits on Burke size imposed by the kernel. What is more, applications have started using transient allocations larger than 128 kilobits that was imagined in 2001. The price for MMAP is also high now. Each time glibc MMAPs from the kernel, the kernel is forced to zero out the memory it gives to the application. So I guess it didn't use to zero memory before, which sounds dangerous. Zeroing memory is expensive and eats a lot of cache and memory bandwidth. This has nothing to do with the efficiency of the virtual memory system. By doing MMAP, the kernel just has no choice but to zero. 2001, the kernel had a maximum size for Burke, which was about 800 megabytes on 32-bit x86. And that, at that point, Burke would hit the first MMAP shared libraries and couldn't expand anymore. With current 2.6 kernels, the VA space layout is different and Burke and MMAP can both span the entire heap at will. So they, use a, uh, they now use a dynamic threshold. Hmm. What is this function doing, though? See if we can find calls to Burke. We have Burke base. Here's do malloc state. Properties of malloc state. This may be useful for debugging malloc. I don't want debugging. Here's sys malloc. 
We've got an old top and old end. Um, we've got SND Burke, maybe second Burke, second return value. Burke is the return value from more core. Um, if we have NMAP and the request size meets the NMAP threshold and the system supports NMAP, then there are few enough currently allocated NMAP re and there are fewer, few enough currently allocated MemMap regions. Try to directly map this request rather than expanding top. So we do some, I guess, some if statement that amounts to whatever was said in that um, in that comment. And we've got this car MM, which I'm going to guess is MMAP. And then we'll look at the MP HP page size, verify that it's bigger than zero. Now, whatever NB is, that is bigger than or equal to the HP page size. And we ultimately call sysmalloc map we check if it failed um, and then we record that we've tried mmap if there are no usable arenas and mmap also failed then that means that av is null and we'll return zero and then we've got record incoming configuration of top what is this sys malloc internal size m state but this only seems to be, it seems like if we, um, if we're done here, then we're, we've returned if AV is null. I guess that's only null if we, um, we tried to MMAP. So do we try Burke down here? So we get Burke equals second Burke of more core failure. Recording some state here, we're going to assert some stuff. And if AV is not equal to the main arena, then we do some heap stuff. We get heap info. First, try to extend the current heap. Okay, we'll try to extend, I guess this is some heap of, of memory that we've allocated. Um, if we've managed to extend it, I guess we'll, we could try to use a newly allocated heap. Oh, I guess if we don't, if we don't extend it, maybe we can use a newly allocated heap, I guess. Um, if we haven't tried MMAP, we'll do some of this stuff. We can at least try to use the MMAP memory. If new heap fails, it is unlikely that trying to allocate huge pages will succeed. Okay. And if we're done here at else, that means AV is equal to the main arena. And we'll request enough space for NB plus pad plus overhead. If contiguous, we can subtract out existing space that we hope to combine with new space. Okay. And yeah, so check if it's continuous. Bunch of stuff. All right. I'm not going to look too much more closely. This, I mean, this is pretty fascinating. Um, but since we're two and a half hours in, um, and we have a sense of the algorithm from the from the comments in Wikipedia, and we have a sense of how the code is written other where, elsewhere here, I'm going to say that this is you know, if you want to know more about this nmap, um, more about this malloc implementation, I'll leave it as homework. For the reader. All right. So that that's malloc. Um, is this the file that I? Just pulled up. I think it is. Okay. What else do we have? Malloc internal. There's not much here. Malloc internal. Maybe in the C file. Nope. Okay. In dynamic array, is inside of malloc, and it's gonna have a dynamically resizable array, right? libc dynamic resize internal function enlarge the dynamically allocated area of the array to make room for at least size elements which must be larger than the existing used part of the dynamic array scratch is a pointer to the scratch area which is not heap allocated and must not be freed okay that's ultimately like under the hood let's see if we can find resize that's the that's the interesting part of the array right wait where's the syntax highlighting There you go. So dynamic, uh, dynamic array resizes, I guess it returns a bool if you fail. The existing allocation provides sufficient room. First, we check that size is less than or equal to the list allocated. If it is, then we'll set list used to equal size and return true. Otherwise, use size as the new allocation size, the caller is expected to provide the final size of the array. So there's no over allocation here. 
So the color is going to provide the, the final size. So not, um, you, you, you can't request more stuff than you actually need, I guess is what it's saying. So you've got this new size bytes, whatever int multiply wrap V is, it might be some overflow. Um, we're going to create a new array. And if the list array is equal to scratch, the previous array was not heap allocated. So we'll get a new array to, by malloking the new size bytes. And if the new array is non-null and list array is non-null, then we're going to just mem copy into the new array. Otherwise, we're going to new array will be realloc of the list array with the new size bytes. We'll check that it's non-null. We'll set list array to the new array, the list allocated to size, and list used to size. All right, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, here's diner, diner array resize clear. Uh, I'm not gonna look at that. <laughs> it's gonna be some sort of reason. Oops, did I just terminate something important? I don't think I did, hang on. Or maybe I did. So I'm going to guess dynamic array resize is um, not so not so critical. Okay. Uh, ignore all this stuff. Arena.c might be interesting. So we've got some compile time constants. So heap size min heap min size and max size is the size of m mapped heaps memory mapped heaps that are dynamically created for multi threaded programs. The maximum size must be a power of two for fast determination of which heap belongs to a chunk. It should be much larger than the M map threshold so that requests with a size just below that threshold can be fulfilled without creating too many heaps. When huge pages are used to create new arenas, the maximum and minimum sizes are based on the runtime to find huge page size. All right. We've got some page size stuff. Here's the heap info. We have M state, an arena for this heap, heap info size, page size. We can sanity check heap info alignment, which is a really simple implement implementation. And then we have thread specific data. I don't know what M state is. Maybe memory state. And then we've got a free list, I guess, of free memory stuff that we can allocate. And a list lock prevents current prevents concurrent writes to the next member of struct malloc state objects. Cool. And we've got this Boolean about whether malloc was initialized, which is set to false. And arena get acquires an arena and locks the corresponding mutex. First try, try the one last locked successfully by this thread. This is the common case and handled by with a macro for speed. So I guess the most common thing, if you're working with arenas, is to reuse them. And we saw arenas, um, I think the only time we've seen arenas really is maybe in gRPC, where I believe they were used for calls. So when you use, when you have RPC, gRPC, you create a lot of call objects, which are used to essentially configure the, um, the function call you're making on the remote server. And I think that um, arenas are, are frequently used for that. And I guess in that case, if you're making a lot of calls, it makes sense once your call is done to reuse the, the thing that you most recently used. I'm guessing that's the sort of thing he's talking about. If no arena, arena is, oh, okay. So then loop once over the circularly linked list of arenas. So I guess if we can't use the one that was most recently used, we'll just loop over this list and it's circular. So if we get to the end, we're back at the beginning. If no arena is readily available, Create a new one. Okay, so the in the worst case, I guess, we might have to create a new arena. In this case, size is just a hint as to how much memory will be required immediately in the arena. Okay. So arena get is a macro. It's going to take a pointer to size. And it's got this do thing while zero forever. We're going to, uh, I guess, the thread arena we're going to set to pointer, and we're going to and we're going to lock it. Well, zero. Zero is false. <laughs> I don't know. Let's uh, 
Hmm. Is this just a way to get this block of code into a into a um, macro? Let's ask Bard. I'm not really sure why why it's uh, defined this way. So. Yeah, I know that part. The do while zero statement. This statement is used to ensure that the code inside the macro is executed even if there are even if there are no errors. Uh what? So why does um This is useful for macros that need to perform some setup or cleanup work, even if the macro itself does not return an error. Are macros supposed to return an error? Um, the do while zero statement is used to ensure that the memory arena is locked. Okay. Let's see what chat GPT has to say. Chat GPT might have gone to sleep. These slashes come from. They re they really are here. Hmm. The single yeah do while loop of the single iteration that says yeah. The while zero at the end is a common C idiom that ensures that the macro is always terminated with a semicolon when it is used in code. Okay. So something about macros being terminated with a semicolon. I'm not sure why. All right, but arena lock. So if pointer, so we're gonna give it a pointer. So if pointer is not null, we'll call libc lock lock with the pointer mutex. Otherwise, we're gonna set pointer to arena get two of size and null. All right. So find the heap and corresponding arena for a given pointer. So heap for pointer is I get to make the heap size and then some pointer alignment thing. Malloc fork lock parent at fork spread. The following three functions are called around fork from a multi threaded process. We do not use the general fork handler mechanism to make sure that our handlers are the last ones being called. Okay. So I'll, I'll kind of leave this file at this. This is, this is actually pretty interesting, but um, we can't be here forever. I'm going to actually ignore all the rest of the. Uh, Alex allocation stuff. Here's INET for ARPA. And there's nothing really here. That's too bad. Do you get anything in the C file? No? Oh, it's just include. Okay. Here's name sir for ARPA. This machine's allow this if the machine allows unaligned access, we can do better than using the NS get stuff. Name unpack. Lib resolve hidden proto. Verify that P points to the uncompressed domain name in wire format. On success, return the length of the encoded name. I don't know what any of this is doing. I'm guessing this is for ARPA, right? What about what if we blame? I wonder how old it is. 17 years ago, 29 years ago? Initial import. Let's look at this. Two thousand six. Hmm. Look up Arpa. IARPA, Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity. Dot ARPA, address and routing parameter area, top level domain, the domain system. 
precursor to DARPA. I'm not really sure what's going on. I I figured this was related to ARPANET, but I don't think that existed in 20, 2006. Look up ARPANET. ARPANET was the first wide area packet switch network with distributed control and one of the first networks to implement TCP over IP. TCP IP protocol suite. Both technologies became the technological foundation of the internet. The ARPANET was established by ARPA of the United States Defense. So it closed in 1990. So whatever this code is doing and whatever modifications they were making in 2006, it doesn't seem like it was for ARPANET. That's okay. And it was established in what, 1969? Very cool. Here's Telnet for ARPA, and there's nothing here. All right. TFTP, and it's just some include. Okay, memory will ignore. PTY is just an include. I guess there's nothing, nothing so interesting here. We've got fork PTY though. Here's more scheduling stuff, which we're going to ignore. Spawn is not so interesting. Stab <laughs> includes miscellaneous stab. Let's see if we can find miscellaneous stab. Maybe stab is stability. Stab def, define stab, indicate that new stab.h. What is stab.h? S tabs, is it, oh, it's like file S tab. Stabs. The stabs debugging symbol tables. So some sort of symbol table. In fact, S must stand for symbol. Okay. So it's not stabs, it's S tabs, which is okay, but slightly less ominous. Here's includes stack info. We've got things like whether the stack grows up or grows down. Which is interesting. A sysdep stack info dot h file determines defines details for CPU. Um, so I think in, uh, it would be instructive to go through um, maybe the Linux x86-64 implementation of a bunch of these platform-specific stuff, but I'm not going to do that now. And um, we might at some point, but I think that's where a lot of the, the real stuff is. But I, w I guess I would guess that like um, there's, there's going to be so I'm just fiddling around to make sure that there's a not a mismatch between what glibc is doing and what the platform expects. So that's some of what's going to be in that implementation. And then uh, a lot of it's just going to be system calls um, to the kernel. And so I suspect that a lot of stuff we would see there, we would ultimately run against the limit of what's interesting as we dig down. And the stuff that's actually interesting will, will really be in the kernel, I would guess. But at least we're getting a sense of like, what hell glibc is is laid out and and stuff like that your string yeah everything is external i'm not sure exactly where these external things are defined but i'm guessing um, they're essentially platform specific uh, okay strings at h u limit again uh, no Nothing so interesting. Pthread. Uh, include pthread is not interesting. Pthread join in uh, NTPL. This is probably the actual implementation, I think. If I remember N NTPL. Or not. You have pthread clock join. Did I open the C file? This is the C file. So we're just returning pthread clock join. And I guess that means That we're using the clock to decide when to join. Clock join. So pthread clock join NP64. Then take a thread ID, a thread return thing, a clock ID, and a time span, absolute time. And we'll check if uh, we've got like a, a fast user uh, mutex thing, futex, uh, whether it's, a, I guess, whether the clock ID is supported. And if so, we're going to call pthread clock join x. So where is that defined? I'm guessing 
probably against some result, some some platform specific. I don't know. Here's pthread mutex lock. What is three L's? LLL lock with single threaded optimization. Some of the following definitions differ when pthread mutex con lock includes this file. LLL mutex lock. I don't know what that means. LLL. What is LLL lock? Is there a Wikipedia? Parallel LLL. The variant of LLL lattice basis reduction. This is, I think, different. A different LLL. Lambda, lambda, lambda. Thirty. Low-level programming languages. What are the programming languages used in Ethereum? The Landau level for wave functions and quantum mechanics. Lattice basis reduction. Maybe it's for low-level language, low-level lock. A single-threaded optimization is only valid for private mutexes. For process-shared mutexes, a mutex could be in a shared mapping, so synchronization with another process is needed even without any threads. Okay, if the lock is already marked as acquired, POSIX requires that pthread mutex lock deadlocks for normal mutexes, so skip the, the optimization in that case as well. So... If we're shared, oh, no, no, private is just being declared as a variable. We check whether it's private and also this other condition, in which case mutex data underscore lock is one. Otherwise we call LLL lock. And do we have this implemented? Define, okay. So we're making calls to LLL lock. This is big function. pthread mutex lock full. Just look at it. It's going to take a mutex. And we're going to call thread get mem on ourself. And whatever TID is, thread ID. And we'll get an ID. And then we'll switch on the mutex type. And I guess pthread must have a bunch of mutex types defined. We might call thread set memory. We've got some sort of infinite loop here. This is set to futex waiters. If and only if we might have shared the futex waiters flag with other threads. Hmm. So while one, we're going to try to acquire, acquire the lock through whatever CAS is from zero, not acquired, to our TID. Assume other futex waiters. Okay. okay. So we might get the mutex. We must not enqueue the mutex before we've acquired it. Okay. So I guess if we've acquired it, we might enqueue it. There's some assembly thing, it looks like. And we're going to call thread set mem. Yeah, okay. And there might be some other stuff if we have futex to find. All right, that's about all I'm going to look at. <laughs> this is pthread mutex lock. Here's pthread mutex in it. Prio inherit missing, maybe priority, pthread mutex in it. All right. Here's read write lock in it. And then some spin lock. And again, there's not a lot here in these implementations. Or at least the, the last two I looked at. Atomic compare exchange weak acquire. Lock is contented. We need to wait. Going straight back to comp exchange is not a good idea on many targets that will force expensive memory. All right. So that's an initial look through. 
I want to see if I can find, let's see if, maybe just to find a string. See if you can find a, like, a platform specific string thing. I don't know if this is something that's actually platform specific, but I think I grabbed what I meant to do find red we've got string.h and includes string.h let's look at string.h that mem copy which is external what's down here it's lots of externals and and all this other stuff like String copy. We have the str copy. And the implementation is just throw. See if we can find references. Benchmarks, NSCD. I don't know what NSCD is. Heard, look up, retry. String tester. There's no no instances of string copy. What am I doing wrong? Is this, is it uh, copy without without no? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So here's Here's what? I don't know. Locales, inet, malloc, socket, bench tests. I don't care about bench tests. libc ABI list. We do get, uh, how about ifunk implementation list? This is interesting. We have this this comment that says support systeps i386, i686, multi arch string copy.s. And we have ifunk implementation, ifunk impl of i name string copy. And it looks like we're kind of registering a an actual implementation. And if we if the CPU feature SSE3 is usable, then we're going to use underscore underscore string copy SSE3. Let's look at that. So tag can't find a implementation. You know. Okay, so let's look at SSE3. Do we only have two? Now let's look at SSE2. We're going to define stir copy to stir copy SSE2. Can we go to the definition? Oh, no, no, we're defining SS. Yeah, I see. We're defining uh, stir copy SSE2 as all caps stir copy. And uh, what is dot S? Is this like assembly? It's like assembly, maybe. And so we have this implementation. This entry string copy with dot text. 
and our mode is assembler. So this, this looks like assembly. And it looks like we have an assembly based implementation of string copy. So I'm guessing that what's going on is that a lot of the stuff we looked at, we kind of bottomed out where uh, things were externally defined. And it seemed like maybe there was some some platform specific implementation. And, and I think that's maybe what we just found, this iFunk stuff. So iFunk seems to be registering implementations for specific architectures. Return the member of iFunk implementations. And for function func, if string name matches func. And maybe this is just for strings. If string, no, no, string compare is being used because it has to compare the names. So if string compare name and function is zero, I guess that means they're equal. Then size t of n equals zero, and v, whatever va args is, then return n. Then add um, add an ifunc implementation impl for function func to array with usable at index i and advance i by one. Okay, so whatever ifunc is. We have other iFunk stuff. Look up glibc iFunk. GNU iFunk. The GNU indirect function support iFunk is a feature of the GNU toolchain that allows the developer to create multiple implementations of a given function and to select amongst them at runtime using a resolver function which is also written by the developer. The, the resolver function is called by the dynamic loader during early startup to resolve which of the implementations will be used by the application. Once an implementation choice is made, it is fixed and may not be changed for the lifetime of the process. Okay, so that, that seems to be one way of getting an implementation. I wonder if there are other. Um, let's try to find grep of str copy again in the root directory. So how else can we get an implementation of stir copy? I mean, maybe that's the only way. We have canonicalize. I don't think that's it. Resolve. Elf. Maybe we want underscore underscore string copy. Let's try that. It seems like they use double underscores for actual implementations. Built-in string copy check. Here's string, here's debug, power PC, extern type of string copy, multi-art string copy, string copy power nine. Let's see iFunk redirected. Yep, no. Maybe this iFunk thing is is all there is. We have this ABI list stuff. That's, that's just a list. It doesn't seem to be registering anything. Okay, so let's try where is street copy defined in, um, in glibc. Define a seven files as a macro. Multi arch. If isn't, it's a dry street redirect string copy. Okay, so if we're in libc, I guess, to find multiple versions only for the definition in libc. If is in libc, we'll define string copy to redirect string copy. I'm guessing redirect is maybe the thing that we just saw, the indirect functions. And we'll include string.h and undef 
You can copy. Include ifunk SSE, <laughs> SSE3, and then we'll say libcfunk redirected. So I'm guessing this is just how it works. And it's defined as a function in a couple of these. How about Spark? But this is like assembly again. Okay. So I'm guessing that's how it works, is that we um, have some implementations that we, for the most part, and we, and we register them. Maybe not everything works that way, um, but some of the stuff seems to. And that is glibc. Uh, that was very long. glibc is humongous. And like I said toward the beginning, this is like a bus tour um, and not really digging in to um, any implementation. We did, um, we've done sort of a, a similar thing with the Linux kernel. And just in general, I think as we, for these really large projects, somebody had asked me um, a, a couple of days ago how I think about large projects. And uh, the general theme in all of this is I, I tend to do things in um, different passes. So uh, ordinarily, I wouldn't have taken whatever it's been three hours or so to do to do a single pass. How long has it been? About three hours. Um, I would really do normally a pass in like half an hour or an hour if it was something that I, that I was really unfamiliar with and was large like glibc. And then each time I go through, I would I would do another pass and kind of get more depth and try to focus, try to figure out what is most interesting to me and focus down. Um, but for at least for these fan requests, I wanted to um, do a little bit more in one pass just so because people might be interested in dip different things that I'm interested in. People have different backgrounds. Um, and that way there, you know, there's more of a chance that people will find um, something interesting in here that um, than if we just did a, did a really quick one. Um, but for things like this, I think you ultimately have to keep coming back and um, digging in further bit by bit. And so we may do that if, um, certainly we'll do that for the kernel. Um, and we may do that for glibc and for some other stuff. So that's it for me. Uh, I hope uh, everyone's doing great and I hope you have a good weekend and thanks for watching.